We're now going to go to um, a beautiful theme. We're going to change scale. As you have seen, we're changing scale. We're going from urban territories to homes to now also objects. And we're going to talk about regenerative design. Now, there's many ways to be sustainable. There's many ways to be responsible. There's many ways to be good citizens. And, you know, amongst them, there's also this idea of regenerative, and it also intersects systems. And to talk about it today, we have two wonderful human beings, the first being Sara Mineko Ichioka, who's a strategist, an urbanist, a curator, a writer, and uh, a long time uh, partner in crime of mine because we've been on many panels together and committees, and she's always been a great interlocutor. And she's been working on this particular subject for a while and also published a beautiful book called Flourish. And the second person is Natsai Audrey Chiesa, who unfortunately could not make it here. She was already going to the airport and then a family emergency prevented her to leave Oslo. So she's going to join us from, uh, from Oslo on Zoom. And she is, uh, she's what her official way of saying is that she's a designer and an equitable development of consumer biotechnology expert. But in truth, to, to just tell you our story, Natsai and I met several years ago because I've been studying biodesign and she's been making biodesign and actually being a pioneer in that. What is interesting is that biodesign can remain speculative and almost science fiction-y, but in her case, it's really about the systems. She tries to translate the values and transform the system, systems across education design. So once again, a regenerative model. So I would like to start by calling on stage my good friend, Sara Ichioka. <laughs> Thanks so much, Paula. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a huge privilege to be here today at this beautiful symposium alongside so many colleagues I respect and admire. Um, and just as a side note, three years ago, my team at Desire Alliance were deeply honored to be part of a larger team appointed by Mark at DSG to help them reimagine a future-facing Singapore Design Week and it's absolutely thrilling to see so many of the co-created plans now coming to fruition here with all of you. So my remarks today will seek to supplement more technically focused solutions to the design and development of our built environment by taking a culture-based approach. And as we're briefed by Paula to speak about regenerative design today, I'd like to turn our attention to the importance of traditional forms of knowledge around the world in framing future debates about how we humans can integrate the way we live with the rest of the web of life. In recent days, over one third of our neighbor Pakistan has been underwater with half a million households displaced or damaged and at least twice the capacity of this concert hall having lost their lives. The deluge brought on by heavier than usual monsoon rains and melting glaciers is simply the latest of many clear signs to which we become, we risk becoming numb or distracted that our extractivist industrialized society is simply on the path to breakdown. For decades now, for, for the most of the lifetimes of us in the room today, we have been looking for, quote, sustainable ways to interrupt our tumble down this path. In the built environment sector, where most, much of my own work is focused, many have come up with ingenious technical solutions, some of which we've already heard about today. And Singapore itself has long enjoyed an illustrious reputation for seemingly marrying urban development and environmental consciousness to create the futuristic metropolis nestled within lush greenery that we inhabit today. And understandably, such achievements in wealthy parts of the world have tended to reinforce the belief that it's possible to design our way out of the, our compound crises while allowing business to continue pretty much as usual. But more and more of us are waking up to the reality that this is not enough. 
In the three decades since sustainability first entered the mainstream with the Brundtland Report, more than half of the world's total historic greenhouse gas emissions have been released. It's absolutely clear we must evolve beyond a sustainability that perpetuates business as usual towards framings that open up other possibilities. It was with this aim that my dear friend and collaborator, the London-based architect Michael Pollan, and I decided to write the new book that Paola has kindly mentioned. Um, this book reflects our shared conviction that significant shifts need to happen at the level of our collective mindsets to enable us as designers or clients of, or users of design to effectively build a world that seeks not only to be less bad, but to make a net positive impact. This vision builds on the work of thinkers and practi practitioners, myriad, uh, including B Bill Reed of the Regenesis Group, who has been a long time proponent of regenerative design and development. It's also inspired by the amazing systems thinker, Donella Meadows, who identified a dozen possible ways of places that we could intervene to affect change within a given system. She identified the two most effective at the level of the mindset or paradigm out of which the system arises and the power to transcend paradigms. When we talk about transcending paradigms, we mean creating a different, more persuasive story than the ones that currently shape our collective worldviews. One persistent degenerative story is that of human exceptionalism. In this story, our industrialized dualistic view of our relationship with the rest of the living world has made us earth exploiters rather than earth keepers. And I'm using the words here of Professor James Zagude, who's director of the African Observatory for Environmental Humanities. Countless traditional forms of knowledge and practices around the world are underpinned by ideas of interdependence, bioinclusivity, and collaboration. Agude, whose own research draws from various indigenous forms of ecological conservation, has written extensively, for example, about the concept of Ubuntu, which translates from Naguni Bantu to mean I am because we are. It's a philosophy that rests on the principle of co-agency and that places emphasis on the dialogical relationship between humans and non-humans, collapsing the dichotomy we've created between culture and nature. What does it mean to design in a way, our way into a new or rediscovered regenerative story, which aims to replace these deeply ingrained notions of human dominion over nature with the understanding that we are, in fact, participants in a diverse and interconnected world. To make the commensurate adjustment to our practices, we must find a way to answer the question posed by the philosopher Freya Matthews. What does nature want us to want? But first we must define which particular manifestation of nature we're addressing, because a regenerative approach to design and development will promote a deep connection with place as partner. This requires us as designers to reacquire the skills to be constantly in dialogue with that which, clo which is closest to us. As biologist Robin Wall Kimmerer aptly puts it, to be native to a place, we must learn to speak its language. An essential aspect of regenerative design is that it embraces the need to repair past harms to the biosphere and learn from nature. However, there can be a risk here of perpetuating the old dualist view of conservation that sees nature as separate from us, out there, in need of our protection. Truly degenerative, regenerative design will operate from the understanding that we also need to repair human culture and understand ourselves as an integral part of nature. So to close, circling back to Wal Kimmerer's point about the importance of spatial fluency, this implies that each place may have its own languages or dialects. Um, there's a powerful complementary concept that I'd like to turn our attention to of the ethnosphere, which was coined by the anthropologist Wade Davis. The ethnosphere refers to the sum total of all thoughts, dreams, ideas, beliefs, intuitions, and inspirations brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. In Davis's words, it's a symbol of all we've accomplished and all we can accomplish. To regenerate the biosphere, we need to call upon the resource of human experience in all its diversity. We need to respect, protect, and regenerate the ethnosphere. In this respect, regenerative design can never be a solely technical solution. It has to be rooted in the specificities of its socio-cultural context.
Looking at this diverse region of Southeast Asia, we can find many examples of built environment practices that are fluent in natural cultural dialects. Possi there are countless possible examples, but in the Philippines, we can find, still find naturally cooling traditional houses that are not only built from local materials and adopted to these climates, but whose building process is culturally grounded in processes of mutual aid. What strength and wisdom do we have, to, do we stand to gain by humbly learning from such practices that have and continue to exist outside of industrialized society? We can also look to contemporary examples from the region, including the arc building of the Green School in Bali by Ibuku and Atelier One, which combines deep local knowledge of craftsmanship with cutting edge engineering techniques. To grasp these learning points, we must adopt a generous mindset that not only welcomes, but actively seeks out communities and practitioners who have shown us that we are capable of living within other paradigms under diverse contexts. Conserving and cultivating the ethnosphere in which a myriad of worldviews and ways of being exist can help us imagine how to retrofit our degenerative, dualistic modern cities for regenerative practices that care for the web of life that sustains us. And I promise, Paula, this is the last slide. Specifically for this audience, where could embracing an even wider plurality of cultures, worldviews, and stories take Singapore a nation that has long been a hub of exchange and that has valued multiculturalism from its very birth. How can Singapore model the regenerative retrofit of its inherited spaces, which may be formally aspirational, but conceived in service to economic systems that no longer or arguably never serve the best interests of the majority of life on this planet? As people who have been entrusted to shape our built environment, we have tremendous potential agency to bring these imaginations to life. Singapore as a world-class example of strategic urban design is in a potentially crucial position to challenge and imbue the wider culture of design and development with truly regenerative mindsets and methods. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So happy you showed Shu Tian Tian. I was about showing it too. And now we're gonna have Natsai Audrey Chiesa. There she is. Hi, Natsai. Perfect. Hi, I wish Paolo. you could see the audience. We're going to send you pictures. It's a big theater, and uh, they are all excited. And no, full, full house. So off you go. I'm just not making you feel under pressure here. <laughs> Thank you for the warm welcome, Paula. And although I can't be there in person, I'm really thrilled to still be able to share our perspectives on designing transformational change with you all today. Um, so Faber Futures, we are a design agency that is at the nexus of biotechnology and society. We work across industries, institutions, and brands to develop ecologically driven models for holistic innovation. From design strategy to spatial practice, our studio and core team operates from these principles. We work in defense of the world to come. We design for systemic change. We carry an inquisitive attitude to novel solutions and deliver mutual benefit through collaborative effort. So today I'd like to share two projects that embody those principles, beginning with Project CD Color. CD Color means sky blue in Latin. This microorganism, Streptomyces silicolum, is a soil dwelling microbe. We've all encountered it in the wild. It releases a compound called geosmin, or to us, the smell of rain. It also gives beetroot its flavor and decomposes organic matter in the soil. In the lab, this well studied organism produces antibiotics for the pharmaceutical industry. In 2011, as a recent graduate of Material Futures at Central St. Martins in London, I began a residency at the Ward Lab at University College London's Department of Biochemical Engineering, discovering that culturing Streptomyces sedicolor directly onto textiles at an ambient temperature, its natural sky blue pigment offered a toxin-free and highly water efficient alternative to our current harmful practices of dyeing and printing fabrics. We explored what Streptomyces silicolor could do in the context of fashion design, developing replicable protocols and tools to dye protein-based textiles for specific aesthetic outcomes. 
where Streptomyces silicolor produces its pigment naturally. Synthetic biology is a technology that will allow us to customize the organism for an expanded color palette, perhaps designing into the DNA of the organism shorter lead times for the fermentation of the desired pigment molecule at even higher yields, larger scale and lower cost. Though these are essential metrics in our present economic system, we believe that the real transformational possibility of the emerging bioeconomy lies in reshaping the value drivers of the technologies it services. Technologies like synthetic biology are beginning to allow us to swap out animal and petroleum-based ingredients and materials in everyday products for alternatives that are fermented by bacteria, fungi, and yeast. But ignoring our underlying system of resource extraction, consumption, and waste risks placing strategic limitations on this so-called biomanufacturing revolution. We already know how to ferment wine and beer at scale, but realizing the promises of synthetic biology also re requires us to scale mindset shifts, interdisciplinary education, circular design, supply chains and business models, and infrastructure. These are all sites for design to act. So while STEM has evolved to include A for Arts, a systems approach to innovation is incomplete without a distinct B for design, as Paola Antonelli and others have long advocated. So given the ecological emergency facing this planet Earth, who then gets to redesign humankind's relationship with the living world and the technologies that mediate it? In 2020, the World Economic Forum convened the Global Future Council of, on Synthetic Biology, reflecting on the unrealized promises of the field and articulating how the advancement of synthetic biology can benefit both people and the planet. Four important values to bring this potential into being emerge from the council's work, equity, humility, sustainability, and solidarity. The forum invited Faber Futures to engage with the nuance and specificity of what these and other emergent values mean in practice. So we developed BioStories, a project that embodies how humankind has come together for millennia to make sense of the world, gathering in circles with objects for shared storytelling. BioStories is an expansive project comprising an iterative methodology for curating, hosting, and translating artifact-led multi-stakeholder dialogues into new narratives and tangible insights. Rather than the usual uh, emphasis of focusing on the stakeholders' level of understanding of synthetic biology as a technology, instead we invited stakeholders to share an artifact representing their own relationship with the living world. These artifacts prompted discussion, spun out new narratives and modes of storytelling that begin to give us a deeper understanding of what is at stake as we design the living world. These dialogues inspired the Museum of Symbiosis, a science fiction by writer Claire Evans that helps us imagine that other biological features are indeed possible. At the same time, anthropologist Dr. Melissa Salm's di dialogue synthesis analyzes and codifies hours and hours of transcripts for themes, connections, and new directions. From her analysis, we learned that stakeholders revealed an expanded set of values for us to consider, from discernment to novelty, locality, and regenerative by design. The farmer, the engineer, the grandmother, the artist, and the curator appear throughout all of the conversations, teaching us how to translate these values into practice. And significantly tangible insights for policymakers who wish to enable the futures that these stories foreground um, include the need to facilitate frameworks for problem solving and curiosity-driven research, and synthetic biology developments rooted in quantitative and qualitative analyses of impacts. BioStories offers methods and practices to democratize participation, 
generate new narratives and inform policy for the scale up of synthetic biology. The full report is freely available to download from our website and I encourage you to dig in. There's a lot of content there that's really inspiring. So in closing, I will leave you with, with a final provocation that if taken seriously, can create the conditions for genuinely equitable technologies that we might upstream another D for democracy in our approach to science and innovation. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Natalia. That was great. And um, now we'll bring you back on stage. Uh, and Sarah, will you come with me? Can we see Natsai over there? She cannot see us, but we want to see her face. She's going to come back. Oh, here she is. We can see you well. Oh, right. Natsai, that was a really, really great presentation. And it's funny because we've been talking about grandmothers. I like that you had also the grandmother in your list and that Amy before talked about it. And I remember seeing an exhibition in Seoul several years ago at the museum. It was a media arts festival called Ghosts, Shamans, and Grandmothers. So clearly, the wisdom of the future resides with them. So this was a, a, a wonderful conversation. And uh, many of the questions that I received from the audience are about the uh, the apparent contrast and opposition between the selfishness of, of individuals and the need instead to have this kind of generosity, altruism, and, uh, and sense of the future that is necessary for the mindset shift that you both, that you both talked about. So let's talk about that. Do you see really... Um, an opposition, I'm gonna start with Sarah because one of the questions was especially about Singapore. Do you see an opposition between individual citizens' mindsets and the need instead to act together? I'm so glad uh, someone asked this question. So I think fundamentally, this is one of the key stories that needs to be debunked because if you look back and talk to anthropologists and archeologists, there's not actually any evidence, any more evidence that we are fundamentally selfish as people um, or that we are unable to cooperate or work together towards common goals. And I think this is a relatively recent conception, um, which I know is very much part of the founding narrative. You know, we can think of the founding father, you know, the, the, with great respect, but you know, saying things like, if you don't work hard, there's always someone else who wants to eat your lunch. And that, you know, in, in 50 over years, that can inculcate this idea of innate um, competitiveness. But I actually don't think if you look at how things play out on the ground that you can necessarily see evidence of this. I mean, if you look at all of the mutual aid organizations that arose in, you know, from New York to Singapore, I don't actually see evidence of this individual selfishness per se. I just think it's a story that we've collectively absorbed and sometimes live into. But looking at alternative, alternative stories from by listening to the grandmothers, you know, our collective grandmothers um, can can help us understand that that's not necessarily even true. Thank you. And you know, Natsai, similarly, we're talking, we're becoming. Well, we've been very human all day long, but it's getting more and more into that as the day proceeds. And Natsai, when I met you uh, several years ago, biodesign was uh, populated by amazing pioneers, but at the very beginning, you too, you all had to really deal with the science and the design and you didn't have much time to connect with the rest of the world and to talk about equity and democracy, about everything that you're talking about today. So there's a maturity to the discipline that I'm so glad to see. Um, was that difficult? Did you have to bring others into the game? Did you have to talk to policymakers? How did it, how did it happen? I, I think you're right, Paola, that the kinds of conversations that we're starting to have now um, within the field um, are shifting towards, um, I, I, think, I think when we, when we first started um, in, in this field, people were more concerned with how to raise capital to um, 
actually invest in the R&D that's required for some of these technologies. And now we're moving into a space where we're talking about how to scale up those innovations. And once you start to consider scale up, you're really forced to shift your mindset away from the work that's happening in the lab to how that work is going to live in the real world. Um, because scale up in, in, in involves needing to think about the infrastructures for that, um, the locality for that, um, the, the, the supply chains, um, the, the human beings, and obviously the, the real um, measurable environmental impact of, of, these, of these technologies. So I, I do think that we are starting to understand that um, these technologies are not neutral. Um, and so the, the, the good news is that um, actually within the field of synthetic biology, um, a lot of researchers have been thinking long and hard about some of these um, issues, primarily the ethical issues for a really long time now. Um, and I would say that uh, part of that is, is the fact that genetic engineering um, has a bad rep um, because of the actual practices of businesses um, that, that sort of precede this particular moment in technolog technological um, innovation. So a lot of work has existed. Um, you know, there's a fluency, a, a literacy in what these issues are so that by the time we are now here, um, thinking practically about what scale up looks like um, across the value chain from startups to academics, um, the conversation is much more evolved as to how to make it a transformative technology. Um, policy is being you know, written right now that actually holds a lot of these value drivers from the start. Um, I think we've also learned from the digital revolution that if you try to do it after the fact, um, you're not going to make so much progress. So, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic um, from that perspective that there is a, a maturity and a, a, a sense of reading the room about how we should um, implement these technologies, but it is still very difficult. You've, you've talked about this with other panelists today to square that um, with the realities of our economic paradigm where um, still people want to understand uh, what the bottom line is for this. So there's still much work to be done, I think. Reading the room indeed. And I, I want to thank you, Sarah, for bringing us back to reality and talking about Pakistan and what's going on there. Because truly, um, this reading the room and everything that we're discussing also comes from the fact that the, uh, the crisis, global, local, and at all levels that we're seeing today are interconnected. So it's about, once again, system thinking and system acting. Sarah, you had a slip at some point. You said degenerative instead of, do, of saying regenerative. Yes. And I, I, I liked it because I wanted to ask you, we, you both spoke about extraction and, you know, this idea of, uh, uh, of fighting extraction in architecture and design, fighting exploitation is something that is very much discussed. So what do you see as degenerative design? Can you describe the opposite of what you're advocating? I know that it's, a, it's kind of a weird question, but we're all talking in positives today. So yeah. sometimes we forget instead what we're fighting against. I'm, yeah, I'm so, so I'm so glad you raised that, Paula. Thank you. I, I think one of the major challenges of the sustainability paradigm that so much of us are still working inside is that we kind of think if we get to the point of neutrality, that's all right. But what that leaves behind is the idea is is that that is turning a blind eye to the fact that so much harm has already occurred <laughs> to get us where we are so i think I, I would basically say that anything that doesn't undo past harms is in itself okay degenerative interesting yeah. so we have a lot to pay back Absolutely. And regenerative design is intrinsically proactive and not reactive, but there's yeah. still some work to do before. Absolutely. Right. Um, another question that is interesting for Natsai, what are the economic viable opportunities for regenerative design and biotechnology? So how is there still economic viability or you're still kind of like investing for future returns that are also financial? I think that's um, a really difficult question to, to answer because of how wide the application space is. Um, a, a lot of people are primarily focused right now on scaling their technologies to make the underlying technology itself um, viable. 
um, the the expanded opportunities um, there are are tied to what it means to actually implement um, at scale um, in in the real world. Um, and I think that when we start to connect with this this value that came up in bio stories of um, what are the local implications of these technologies? Do we want to centralize or do we want to decentralize? Then you can start to see how there's other value that's being created um, as you uh, start to map out your, your business plan and strategy about where you're going to be operational from. Um, and I think for me, what's really exciting is if decisions are made about um, a distributed approach to biotechnology, um, that places demands actually on the living organism in terms of um, its productive capacity and um, the kinds of feedstocks, for example. All of these organisms feed on sugar. <laughs> and, and that is one of the, the, the tricky components of this. Um, but if we understand that we can actually design an organism to, um, to consume uh, a, a specific feedstock that has a low environmental impact, um, then we, can, we, can, we have a lot of flexibility to start to add value to places by deciding to set up shop um, there. But I think that um, the, 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 this is a very much a long-term endeavor. And the opportunity we have right now is to put the kinds of systems in place to allow those opportunities to, to, to emerge. What I worry about is that we actually foreclose the possibility of other kinds of models in how we build out these um, biotechnologies if we primarily focus on replacing ingredients in our present system. We have to see it um, from a much wider perspective. Makes sense. Did you have a chance to listen to Stephen Cairns before? I don't know if you were if you were online. I, Black I soldier flies. I, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I caught the, the, the end of it. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you will see everything in the recording. Um, one last question, question for Sarah. Very, very down to earth and understandable. What are some of the key strategies for a regenerative design approach? You should buy the book, but yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> unlike um, Aaron and Emmy, I didn't give the breakdown of our point by points, but gotta buy the book. Well, yeah. I think, I mean, the, the beauty of how you've curated this symposium, Paula, is that we've actually heard a number of them already from the previous speakers. I think if you think about the projects that Munsum and Nirmal um, are initiating or the research they're, they're initiating with their students, this idea of taking responsibility within a given place um, for a building's own needs and then maybe moving beyond that to making a positive contribution. So I'd say a sort of place-based literacy that takes responsibility um, for the long term, I'd say is the key place to start. Um, ground in place. And uh, the, uh, re the responsibility of the individual in all this, when we're talking about agency, you know, the symposium is called Agency for the Future. So the individual as a designer, I certainly, what I love is almost everyone who identifies as a designer that I've heard from today is in no way shrinking from their responsibility, right? Everyone is looking, you know, we, we've, we've heard from everyone today about how they are looking to expand their own agency and that's why I was talking about, you know, moving to influence the system, right? Not just in, not just switching out ingredients, not just ending up with more toxic sludge bricks, right? <laughs> and <laughs> sludge bricks, I love that. Um, from Mei Ling. So yeah, I, th I think I'm so pleased that you chose that for the name of this topic that we, we all have the, the capacity thank you. to expand. Uh, it's, it's also, where's Mark? Yeah, Mark yeah. and Arel, everyone. Yeah. But thank you very much, Natsai. Thank you, Sarah. I, Natsai, uh, yeah, I hope that we will see each other soon. And uh, we, we all thank you very much. And you'll get the recording of the whole symposium soon. So you'll be able to enjoy some, uh, quite a few kindred spirits, I can tell you. So thank you, ciao. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Ciao. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.